Welcome to the Biz Bash podcast, where we make biz strategy a piece of cake. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Cammie, but you might know us better as Eliza and Calligraphy and Cammie Monet. We want to help you, our fellow stationers, artists, and calligraphers, confidently build a profitable and personality-driven creative biz. We're here to share our honest-to-goodness advice and actionable strategies for ambitious artists. So put on your party hat, quit being a procrastinator gator, and let's get this party started. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Biz Birthday Bash podcast. Today, we are talking about a subject we get so many questions on. We know you guys are going to love. We are talking about how to get started in licensing your artwork. And today, we have a very special guest with us. We have Kelsey McNatt of Kelsey M Designs. She is a watercolor artist, and she does a lot of licensing with her work. She's also an interior designer, which is very cool. Um, She's had an Etsy shop since 2013. She's been running her business on the side of her full-time job, but don't let that fool you. She still does like crazy, crazy amounts of orders. And honestly, I don't know how you're not full-time, Kelsey. Like it blows my <laughs> mind uh, how you do all the things you do. And so we're just going to be talking to her about her journey with art licensing and get some tips and tricks on how you guys can get started too. So Kelsey, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Yes. So obviously I just told a little bit about you, but tell us a little bit more about how you got started in art and a little bit about your background. Yeah. So I've been doing art for a really long time, as young as I can remember. And um, my dad was actually a hobby watercolor artist. (laughs) And he actually like worked for American Airlines, but painted on the side. And so I grew up watching him paint and just always loved it. I never actually did anything with watercolor up until 2013, but I always knew I wanted to be creative and do something with my career that way. So when I went to college, I majored in interior design, and then we were wanting to move to Colorado, and uh, I didn't have a job yet, and so I started just painting and practicing and teaching myself and kind of just got started doing it that way and fell in love with it, and then I kind of took off from there. People were like inquiring how to buy stuff. So I decided to just open up an Etsy shop and here we are. So when you say that you just like decided to start an Etsy shop, what did you have in there at the very, very beginning? Like what were your few products? So I have like 700 plus paintings like now in my shop. And I think when I very first started, It was, we love to travel. And so I was really focused on a lot of like my travel pieces and then way more like fashion illustrations uh, at the time. So those were probably like my two like niches, I guess, back then. Um, And I've since kind of maybe gone away from those a little bit, but. Okay. And then when did you start licensing your designs? Well, so there's kind of this. So I really started working with some art licensing companies in early 2019. But before that, I have been submitting to Minted since like 2014. And Minted does do a lot of licensing with other companies um, and partner challenges. So kind of got started in that way. But that's definitely one of those like gray areas for... (laughs) I guess licensing if we want to talk about that but yeah I definitely think of Minted I'm like (laughs) that's kind of like in in my mind too it's like a gray area of licensing because it's like it doesn't feel like a full-on licensing thing but it kind of is and I feel like the commission structure is different and all that so I've never done any of those challenges but I see people do them all the time like the Christmas card ones and stuff so that's really cool that that's how you kind of like dipped your toes in because now I know you're working with a lot bigger companies. So like, well, I don't know if it's necessarily bigger, but as an artist, like once you graduate from like minted and like work with like Target or something like that, you just feel like, oh, okay, I'm in the space now. <laughs> right. Yeah. And actually working with like specific companies that only do art licensing where minted does do like their own stuff on their website. And then they do partner stuff with Target and Pottery Barn and stuff. So yeah, there's a little bit of a difference. Yes. Okay. And I just want to backtrack a little bit because you said your dad was a watercolor artist. And obviously my dad's a watercolor artist too. Does I know he, we have <laughs> I know we have this in common. So does he just he must just be so proud of you as well. I'm like, do you call him and get like tips and stuff too? Or like uh, I mean, he might not do fashion illustrations, but <laughs> just, Yeah, there's I would ask him questions, but uh it's one of those things where it's just like he of course he's so proud. But also, we just have very, very different styles. And I think sometimes it's hard for him to get past the fact that I don't even, like, fill up an entire piece of paper. Like, that's just not my 
aesthetic. And so part of it was just like blazing my own trail in a way and trying to test out and find my own style. Um, but I would definitely like ask, he was always the one, he would buy me all of the like nice products and he got me set up that way. And so anytime I would have a question in terms of like brushes or paints, he was definitely my go-to. Oh, I love that. I know. It's so funny too, because my dad's style is like very filling out the whole piece of paper, like very intricate. And if I do something like that, it just like doesn't sell as well as just like a floral illustration with white around it. I'm like, right. what is this? <laughs> and so that always blows his mind too. It must, it must be like a generational thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. Okay. So let's talk more about your biz structure. So I know you have the Etsy shop and you're doing licensing. So how does that kind of like balance out in terms of your structure? So I kind of like broke it down. So uh, probably about, especially this year, this year has been absolutely like huge for like the growth of my business last year and this year. Etsy is probably um, 70% of my like total revenue. And then the rest is probably like 15% minted, 15% licensing, mainly just because I do have so much with minted. And once you kind of get product on there um, and you get those like monthly commissions that does end up paying out very, very well. But the art licensing is very like long game. So stuff that like was happening maybe last year, I'm maybe just getting paid for it this year. So you have to like really be willing to like wait out those paychecks. Yeah, that's what I've heard. That it just like takes forever to get like those payouts for stuff like that. So that's really interesting. Yeah. (laughs) There's certain types of like, and we can talk about this later, but like most of what I do is like royalty rates instead of like a flat fee or an upfront fee. It's mainly just kind of the way the companies that I work with do business. But I know that there are some that will do like a flat fee. Um, and I've done some of that for certain projects, but I feel like the the greater payout is when you get those like royalty fees. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So let's talk about your first licensing project. How did that all happen? <laughs> well, so, okay, this is kind of, I was trying to think about this earlier. So Minted, actually, I got my first greeting card in Target um, in 2018. And that kind of just... Once I started getting those commission checks for that, I was like, oh my God, like there is, there's something there. Like this is, I'm not even doing anything. It's such great passive income. So I was already wanting to kind of look into that. And I had started doing some of it. I was pregnant that year. So I was like all over the place, but um, I had really wanted to get my stuff in Hobby Lobby and I had no idea where to begin. So I started just Googling, like trying to find a contact within Hobby Lobby and like actually had found um, they do have like an artist like portal, like submission portal. And I had put together this whole thing and um, was really excited about it. And then like a couple days later, got like a big fat like, no, like that's not the route we want to go or whatever. And actually it was like two weeks after that, I had a company reach out to me in my Etsy shop and had sent me this whole long thing about that they're just a company that does art licensing and that they work for Hobby Lobby and Kirkland's primarily. So I talked to her on the phone and we got set up and they were just like a small like mom and pop style like company and they were all so sweet. And so I got set up in the fact that like I sent them, she had actually kind of gone through my shop and starred like a whole bunch of pieces that she thought would be great for like keeping in a database. And so I formatted those all to her and then they will do like buyer meetings every like quarter or specialty buyer meetings for certain things like kids art. And so um, that's kind of how I got started with them. And they are like my main, the main company that I work with. I do have a couple projects and, and certain pieces on some other websites or some with some other companies, but they're the main ones that I um, work with. And I'm trying to think of the first piece that I got a PO with that's been it's been like a about a year and a half working with them. And so it's just that long game again. So that's really cool then that they reached out to you on Etsy. And when they did that, 
Did you like freak out at first and think, is this like a scam? Are they going to trick me? Because I know sometimes with those really long form emails, when somebody's like trying to reach out to you about something, I always get like the heebie-jeebies. I know that sounds super silly, but were you kind of like chewing your nails, like (laughs) wondering if it was legit? (laughs) Actually, all of my licensing stuff has come through Etsy. I've not pursued any like myself that have paid out. Paid out. Wow. Um, most of the ones that have seemed like legit are always ones that they'll provide their website. They always say, if you want to take this off of Etsy, here's my email. Please feel free to email me. And I always feel more comfortable like taking it off of Etsy anyway and just going through email. And so if they provide all of those like things and like contact information, um, it seems a little bit more legit. And and she was willing to talk to me on the phone because I just I had so many yes. questions and like she was having to explain a lot to me. So yeah, there, but there are some scammers. You got to watch out for that. Yeah, for sure. I have to believe it. (laughs) So really cool then that you don't work with an agent at all. So you're not having like a 30%, 40%, you know, whatever agents are taking, you don't, you don't have that. Right. And I don't pay them. I actually, I don't know, but I'm assuming they, they obviously make stuff off of like when they, when they have artists, like get stuff in Hobby Lobby. I'm sure they're making money that way, but I don't directly pay them. Okay. Right. There has to be some sort of incentive for them to find people. (laughs) So that totally makes sense. Oh, sorry guys. I got super distracted because Alex just freaking walked in here and didn't realize I was podcasting. He just (laughs) tried to feed me this Sour Patch energy drink. So, okay. Woo. I am pumped now. Okay. So let's um, talk about like contracts and payment structure within like working with those companies. I feel like they're all so different. Like um, I know there's like non-exclusive license, exclusive license. And I think I've done a little bit of both. And I was curious, like what kind of work you've done? Like, has it been mostly non-exclusive or exclusive? And in case our audience doesn't know, can you just explain a little bit about what that is too? (laughs) Exclusive means that you are basically giving over the rights in a way to to them, you cannot sell it on your own. You cannot have license it to another retailer to sell it. Like they want the exclusive rights to the piece. Um, and then non-exclusive means that you can have multiple retailers selling it, or you can also continue to sell it. The way that so the majority of the work that I have been doing is a five percent royalty rate, and those are specifically like Hobby Lobby and Kirkland's, and then places like. Home Goods or TJ Maxx, who are doing massive volumes, those rates are a lot lower. So maybe like 2%. Um, and then you do have your exclusive and non-exclusive. So I have a couple different ones. I So with my main company that I work for, which is Curated American Artists, if I haven't said that, but they allow me to continue to sell anything that gets picked up in my shop which is what I prefer. So technically it's exclusive to like Hobby Lobby and Kirkland's, but I still get to sell it. So it's kind of both in a way, but if they do pick it up, I then can't turn around and pitch it to another retailer. Yeah. It's a, it's a little strange. I've kind of gotten in trouble a little bit with like trying, not, not that I was trying to double dip, but I just didn't like I had submitted a piece to a minted competition um, for a target greeting card. I did not think it was going to win. Like I was really just like, you know, like trying to see if it would. Um, But I had also submitted it through um, my company. And I guess like Hobby Lobby was interested in it and had started mocking it up when I got the email that was like, oh, you you're going to be in Target. I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) So then I I had to turn around and I was like, okay, well, the bigger payout is with Target. So I'm going to keep the greeting card with them. And then I had to turn around and was kind of like, I am so sorry. Like this is, I really didn't think that this was going to happen. So I just have to be very careful. Try not to have my fingers in too many pots. (laughs) Yes. Got to read every contract (laughs) very well. and Make sure you understand it all. So true. (laughs) Hey guys, we just wanted to hop in and talk about one of our amazing resources, the A to Z directory. All of us have thought at some point, how did she do that? Or how did she make that? And maybe you don't know where to start or how the heck to produce this amazing product you've dreamt up. 
Well, the A to Z directory is the missing puzzle piece in your biz, you guys, seriously. So it's built in the form of a yearly membership and it's your one-stop shop for finding suppliers and vendors for all the things. Literally where to print everything from custom invitations, greeting cards, mugs, koozies, acrylic printing, letterpress, custom ribbon. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and it literally goes from A to Z. From acrylic printers to zipper pouches, we have it in the A to Z directory. We wanna help all of you search less and create more with this list of 300 plus vendors and suppliers. Don't worry, they're very organized. It's not gonna be overwhelming and confusing when you join. And this membership also includes access to a private Facebook community. It's incredibly active and involved. And if you need a question answered fast, that is definitely the place to go. Yeah, our Facebook group really is the best. You guys, everyone is so helpful in there, and we're in there too, um, answering questions that you guys might have. So it's a great way to get access to us and ask us things without sliding into our DMs. So we're more likely to answer you in the Facebook group, just saying. Anyway, <laughs> also in the Facebook group, this is new for 2020, and we're really excited about it. We are hosting monthly power hour Q&A sessions that are live, and these are only available to our A to Z directory members. So you can hop in with us live and ask us all your burning questions in real time and just hang out with us every month. And we do these at different times so you can actually be there live and the replays are always available in the Facebook group for members. This resource is priced at $147 a year, which honestly is extremely affordable and it's full of so many benefits, such as exclusive vendor coupons for members only. And we would love to have you guys join. Seriously, it's kind of like our family and our tribe. So visit bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash directory to sign up today and use coupon code podcast2020 to receive $20 off your first year. That's podcast, all caps, 2020 for $20 off your first year. We can't wait to see you in the Facebook group. There's also, so some of the things, there are flat fees. And I recently actually just did a project with Uncommon Goods for a a piece of artwork that was going to be on top of a can of nuts for the holidays. And Technically, they were considering that a licensing project as well, um, but they they just did a flat fee on that. And but for a project like that, I'm OK with a flat fee. But for a flat fee on an art piece that's going to be in a retail store, your bigger payout is definitely going to be getting that like five percent. Um, unfortunately, the thing is that I think a lot of people don't like really maybe get and I was going to bring up. Uh, one of my recent like purchase orders actually I'm fine like sharing these numbers I think it like helps maybe get an idea but I had gotten a purchase order for Hobby Lobby and the royalty rate is five percent off of the wholesale price Hobby Lobby's wholesale price was three dollars and fifty cents per piece so when you break down the numbers it was like 17 16 17 like cents a piece they this round they purchased like six thousand pieces, so I got a purchase order for like a thousand dollars, and then they sent me a check. And then you know there's like these there's so many stores though, so you do have to you know if it sells out quickly in the store, they're going to put in another order if it does well. So that's kind of what you're banking on, right? Because you think oh man, you know, that like 5% so teeny tiny, but it's kind of like what you said before for that passive income to get a check of a thousand dollars like that from you not having to do the work is still in your favor. So it's kind of like in the long run, I can see how that totally works out, but some that's something that's good for people to be aware of for sure if they're going to get into the licensing. Right. Game. Like I don't I know you can definitely have like a full like income off of licensing, but it's it's a lot of like waiting, a lot of a lot of hard work up front. Um definitely not something that I'm would maybe be pers- like it's fine on the side right now um cuz it's great passive income but to me it, I don't think I could do that necessarily full time. Right, that's maybe where an agent or somebody else like some other middle person would come in and do a lot of the work right. for you. Like pitching your work, finding more companies, really ramping that up to make it a thing and just for people who missed the numbers earlier 
you said that Etsy is still 70% of your revenue. So the majority minted is 15% and then licensing is 15%. Yeah. So yeah, this is by far like not a majority in your business, but still when I hear like, Oh, a thousand dollar check and I'm like 15%. Okay, girl. Yeah. Like that, that's pretty sweet. Like if you're licensing deals, you know, they're 15%, but they're coming in at that rate. So right. You've got your numbers look good. I'll just say that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and Kelsey, do you ever try to negotiate your percentage rates, um, your royalty rates and things like that? Because I, I always do. <laughs> I actually have not ever tried. The one that I was very um, – so I have a, a contract with Ikea – and so I can say a little bit, but not a ton because it's not like out yet. Mm -hmm. um, that is the one that I kind of tried to negotiate with, but they were a UK based licensing company working with a massive company like Ikea. And there was just really no negotiation. Like it was kind of just like, if you want this, like this is what you have to have to take it at. And at that point, I was like, okay, like, this is a piece that doesn't even really like, I had actually like just painted it um, last year. And I was like, I haven't sold a ton, like, I'm more than happy to just like give it to you. And it'll be in all the Ikeas. And I'll make I, I don't I will who will see how much money I make off of it. I'm not sure. But that one was definitely a really low rate. <laughs> Yeah. And, the, you know, at the same time, too, I feel like licensing is also one of those things that just builds clout. Like you can say, hey, I've worked with Ikea. I've worked with this, even though the rate is very low. It kind of opens doors to other things, too. So that's kind of like a payout that it's not really a payout, but it's a, a perk. You know what I right, mean? Like exactly. you can kind of like use um, and have that like in your back pocket, too. So absolutely. Yeah, like even I would take a, a low rate if it was like, yeah, it's going to be an all of Ikea. And I'd be like, oh, okay, that's fine. Unless it was like one of the top sellers. Like you said, this one was exclusive. And I'm really weird about exclusive stuff. So. I, yeah, I am too. And I like started, um, so for example, I had my com main company came to me uh, last, last summer. And they're like, we're getting ready to do a buyer's meeting with Hobby Lobby for their uh, they call it like juvie, which is their like kids and teens. And so they had like certain stuff, like they will always send trend reports and I get a look at them and then kind of paint towards those trends. I can kind of pick which ones that I think maybe fit my style or aesthetic and focus on those. And so I painted, they were really wanting dinosaurs and construction vehicles. And so I painted um, four, they, they wanted sets. So I had painted like four dinosaurs and four vehicles. And I like, I was like, this is definitely not something I ever in a million years thought I would paint. But also like, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a mom now. So like, I'll totally get on board with like trying to help like, boy moms like have cute stuff in their room. I'm a girl mom. So it's like, wait, I've, there's a lot more like product available. And so I really liked what I painted. I actually like, really loved them. And I was like, pretty proud of them. And then so they did not like them. So they passed on them, which was totally fine. And then I listed them in my shop and they're now like my best seller, like by like 1 million like times. It's, it's so it's really awesome for me because it's something I probably never would have ever painted, but I had the opportunity for them. And then they've actually come back and asked to pitch it again, but they would only pitch it if it was exclusive and I said no, because I now have those for sale. Um, they're licensed with like, I work with like iCanvas and American Flat. And those are all non-exclusive. And so if I had to tell them, I was like, I'm sorry, but they're now my best seller. And they're non-exclusive with a couple other licensing companies. So I'm going to have to pass. Doesn't that feel good? You're like shoving yeah. <laughs> because you had your opportunity. You asked for this. You had your opportunity. I turned lemons into lemonade when you guys were jerks and told me no. And I love how that story <laughs> turned out. Like, it, it's so great. Like, the, you know, kind of when one door closes, another opens. And like, this worked out really well. And I think it's a reminder to people, too, like, that there will be moments along the way that are discouraging or you get a no and it's disappointing, but 
look how this turned out. Like hindsight, yeah. right? That's crazy. I'm so glad you shared that. I feel that. like there's a lot of times when you're working with big retailers that you're going to hear no, unfortunately. And even if you have like what you think is like a great product and you're really proud of, I think you can't let it discourage you. Um, otherwise, it's definitely not going to pan out for you. you got to just keep creating. And if anything, you can take the opportunity to, I love that they send like trend reports because I mean, I am an interior designer, so I'm pretty on top of trends in the first place. Like, it's my job and I have to be. But just like getting those trend reports from what retailers are looking for also just kind of helps you stay relevant in the market when it comes to your art. And I don't think there's any shame in painting for, like, I love to paint for myself and paint stuff that I love. And even if no one buys it, but also at the end of the day, Like this is a business and you got to kind of stay on top of trends. So I think it's great to have that element. I would literally pay money to get Hobby Lobby's trend report. (laughs) Like if they were like, hey, you can buy this for $200. I'm like, all right. (laughs) Like from any company, that would be like such a helpful tool. That's always the first thing that they send in the email. They're like, here's the trend report, but this is very confidential. (laughs) And you're like, yes. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Kelsey, can I ask you a question as an interior designer? Yeah. Like taking a little spin, we'll come a right back. Everyone, tangent. I Here we go. <laughs> a little interior design tangent. So like my husband and I bought our first home and we're like repainting some of our rooms yeah. and stuff. In terms of like trends, we picked a gray for our basement. It's called Network Gray by Sherwin Williams. And it's it's like a little more blue than we would would have thought. I don't think in like a bad way per se so like in terms of like longevity (laughs) for gray colors (laughs) this one itself being like a little more blue gray (laughs) what do you think in terms of like is that gonna last us a hot second or in 10 years are people gonna look at that and be like what (laughs) are they thinking well so gray right now is so the trend was for a really long time like beige and then it went to gray for a really long time and now it's like Rage in between. We actually, I think maybe the most common gray that we spec at work is agreeable gray from Sherwin Williams. So you might check that one out. Something that's a little bit okay. more like a warm gray. Okay. Cool. But also, I mean, depending on the ha- your house and where all the light comes in through the windows, every single room might look a little different because of the hue on the wall that the, like the light is casting off of it. Yes. We for sure should have painted a sample in the basement because that doesn't get as much natural light. Yeah. So it looks a little different. So we learned our lesson. But like I said, I don't think it's bad. I think it just like caught us off guard. And I was like, I still think we're in it for like longevity. You know, I don't think this is a <laughs> like a horrible, awful choice. But then again, we look at some of the colors that are in the house and we were like, what were they thinking? And at the time, they probably thought it was a great idea. So that's just going to like be us in 10 years but we can go back well, to like <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. at the end of the day it's your house and you live in it that's why I do not do residential design let me just say that <laughs> oh okay yeah that's great <laughs> clarification cool that's way too personal <laughs> yes yeah very much so all right Cami, help me reel it back into the licensing because I right. can go down the I will design. bring it back on the train <laughs> look at me bringing us all back on track I'm usually the one like that <laughs> Okay, so where am I? Oh, well, so what were some of the things, Kelsey, that like surprised you or were like really challenging about art licensing? Um, definitely probably the timelines. Like I had always like known it was a longer like process. And, you know, these people we even like tell you up front, it could be a long time. But like, I guess I didn't really realize how long until it I actually got into it. And some of them will, even with like Minted, you know, Minted for a long time, would be like pay out quarterly on commissions. Now they like target pays out monthly on my commission report, which is awesome. But even some of the like purchase orders, just like having to wait for it. And by the time you even get a purchase order, sometimes it can take like four more months for it to even be in stores. So like one of my pieces that just landed in Hobby Lobby, like my sunglasses, they, I got that, like purchase order back in June. And then I think it first popped up in the store, maybe a late October. So it's, it's been a while from even when I got paid. 
And of course, you want you want it to be in store so it can sell out so you can get another paycheck. And then, you know, this one that I've been doing with Ikea, I started working with them in January of this year. And the piece isn't even going to be in stores until April of next year. And that's if the pandemic doesn't like mess that up. So holy cow, that is definitely, yeah, timelines are own sex, but. (laughs) (laughs) And then you had already talked about like the payments and the percentages a little bit. So talk about like what the final pieces look like. Uh, How much of a say do you have? So I personally have never had a say. I know that there might be, you know, an instance where you could have a say or if you wanted to have a say, I guess I've never, I I don't want to say cared that much, but like at the end of the day, they are, they're the buyers and they, it's their store and they know what their customers are looking for. And so if they've already selected your artwork, like to me, I don't care if it's in a white frame versus a black frame, but there are times where, so I had a piece, it was like a set piece ended up in Kirkland's and I was looking at it on the website. And I, I mean, I think it was actually pretty cool, but it was not at all like what I had pictured, like in this like interesting, like floater, like wood frame that like has a hanging thing. And I was like, Oh, well that's kind of cool. I had no idea that <laughs> this was what it was going to look like, but I don't get to see those mock-ups. The company actually will mock them up and then take them when they go to buyers meetings they will take the mock-ups with them. So they're not always pitching off of just like art prints or like on the computer. A lot of times they are mocking up the pieces just because it presents better than just a piece of paper. (laughs) Yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I I guess it just depends. I don't care that much to question it. Yeah. (laughs) But. Yeah, yeah. You're just like, yeah, here's my art. (laughs) Give me the paycheck and do what you want at that point. I think you kind of have to be a little bit disconnected to like yeah, let it exactly. go a little bit <laughs> to be successful with it. So um, I oh, have another yes. kind of like loaded question for you too. Not interior design related. Don't worry. I will stay on track. <laughs> for you in your business, like in this season, how are you defining success? Uh, oh my God. <laughs> wow, that was a big <laughs> question that just came out of nowhere. <laughs> She's like, and now we're going to get into this philosophical one. Uh, Real quick. Well, because I think it's an interesting question, especially just with everything with 2020. And so I'm I'm curious how people have, you know, like made the turn this year or I just want to know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I it's definitely loaded. I don't even know where to begin. It's hard. This was always a side business, you know, and my career was always like, and I'm still, I'm just so passionate about my yeah. job. And that's why I have not gone full time. I'm definitely at the place where it's maybe something to consider, like for my Mm -hmm. sanity, Um, because I I could definitely be full time at this point. Um, But I I do. I love my job. So I think right now success for me is just like trying not to. I don't I don't even know. Like it's I've hit revenue goals that I like never in a million years like believed would would Mm -hmm. happen this year, you know, and it kind of started last year. Etsy is like a, a whole like I'm just really passionate about Etsy too um because I feel like people like smack talk it a little bit but like I've just had like so much success on the platform and to me that is like I'm proud of that um so that's successful but I think just being successful and you know my career and being a mom and then running a business and trying not to cry oh <laughs> but yeah it's 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 been good. It's just a yeah. Lot. I seriously have no idea how you like do it all. Like it blows my mind that you still have a full time job because I see like how many orders you're packing up, and I'm like, I am so stressed out for her. Like I pray for you because I'm like, golly, she has so many things. Like, I get so worried. <laughs> like you specifically like stress me out. So <laughs> just know that I'm thinking about you, Kelsey. Uh, well, <laughs> and part of the reason that I was asking that, Kelsey, is to give a little like perspective, I've heard a lot of conversations this year, especially it being 2020 and all and things shifting so much from people who are going back to their day jobs. Like it's happening for a lot of creatives. I did a stint at Publix this summer because I was like, this is what I need in my life right now for my sanity. So like two and a half months of like cashiering, I had to do it. It was what I needed. And I think for some people like success doesn't look like 
being full time in their creative business. And that's really, really okay. Like I've had a lot of friends who have had that conversation recently. As I've talked to people who are like, you know what, I've I've gone back full time with another business or I'm I'm part time again with the company I used to work for, but I'm still super passionate about my creative business. And it's still, you know, it, it's a side business, but it's a business like whether or not it's full time or not. Right. And so I think that was like my weird way at getting at that point is that I just admire you for choosing like the path of success that's right for you. Um, and so congrats on doing it all <laughs> and loving yeah. it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think that a lot of people just want to be their own boss um, and just view that as, well, I'm successful because I own my own business and, but I try to tune people out and just do what's best for me and my family. And I think that's, that's the other thing. No one knows everyone else's situation, whether it's financial or like a mental health situation. And so I think you just have to pave your own path and don't listen to the anything else. And yeah. Just do what's best for you. Oh, yeah. Like I was... I was really afraid because of the stigma kind of of like working full time or not as a creative business owner to like share that I was working at Publix. Like Cami remembers this. I was like, oh, I can't. Let's wait till the end of the episode <laughs> to share this news. I can't do it. I, yeah, I remember listening I'm to that I'm too one. nervous. I'm too nervous. I was like, oh, she should not feel bad about <laughs> that at all. And I really did. I did get such like an outpouring of love from people who are like, oh my gosh, thank you just for being honest because I'm in the same position right now. And it's really easy for us to think that that's like a failure in some sort of way. And it's totally not. I had like the best time working at Publix. I would legit consider going back, guys. Like <laughs> they ask me yeah. all the time when I'm in there. <laughs> um, one of the managers he's like so when are you coming back and I'm like I let me think about it you know I could work like one day a week maybe with like what my life looks like now <laughs> but it's exactly what you said Kelsey it's everyone's individual journeys and what we need for our businesses and we can define success however we want to yeah exactly <laughs> Amen. Okay. Well, now I'm totally lost on our licensing because we have gone from agreeable gray to <laughs> well, success. we oh. Okay, can we entitle this episode Agreeable Gray Success in <laughs> Artwork Licenses? <laughs> we should. Um, well, did we get did we get to the last one about strategy for people? Oh, sorry. Whoopsies. I was just kind of trying to like sneak that one in there. You were trying to get- I know, I know can, what you're we'll, doing, you big sneakerton. <laughs> we'll bookend it, Kelsey, with the final question, and Cammie will ask it. Okay. Okay, okay. So what advice or strategies do you have for someone who hopes to get into art licensing? I think that the main one that people should probably focus on first and foremost is making sure that you have your own aesthetic and style and you're not either all over the map or have lots of things. Um, I know for me, I paint like everything, you know, a little bit. I paint kid art and construction vehicles and travel. But if you look at like all of my work together, I feel like it all has the same style and you could, you know, maybe not know that it's mine necessarily, but it all looks like it came from like the same artist. Um, And retailers really like to have that because you start developing relationships with these retailers and then they will come to you and have like be able to do work. So like I've had my company send me emails and they're like kind of like with the construction vehicle stuff. Right now they are pitching for Scott Living, which is like the property brothers. They're having like an art line and so they're wanting me to work on a couple things for that. Um, so they'll they'll come to you for certain projects. If you have like a very clear, distinct style that the retailer like loves, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Like they, they're like, oh, this is the perfect person for the job. Like we know exactly what we want it to look like and she will fit that. And so it just makes them, it makes it easier for them, easier for them to think of you specifically. Right. Yeah. Or just if you have like maybe like a whimsical style or whatever. I, back in like February, um, they were, Kirkland's was shopping for like holiday stuff already. And they were like, hey, we know you love like holiday art and animals like we want to do something with dogs and 
Halloween. Like that's all they gave me. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like, and so I like came up with like five different pieces and sent them over and they loved like two of them. (laughs) So yeah, it's, it's fun to do that. And then also, like I said, like that just kind of helps you, even if they don't get picked, like you've then created something that's really cool and on trend and you can list it in your shop or on your website. Mm. So they are, okay. I'm just, okay. So some my experience with our licensing has been a little different, but they are coming to you and being like, well, this is kind of what the vibe we're going for. What you got? And then you paint something and they're like, we love this one. We don't love that one kind of thing versus like, this is what we want. And then you do it and then they pay you. <laughs> it's more just like a pitch uh, that they give you and then you kind of take it or not. Yeah. For sort of for specific okay. pieces, um, there's definitely times where they're like, hey, we are going to a buyer's meeting. Here's the trend report. You, I know you have stuff already like in our database that we can pull from. But if you have time, like you're more than welcome to create specifically for this meeting. Or, yeah, or it's like a very specific job. Like the holiday dogs was a separate email just to me that was just for that project. Um, But a lot of times when they send trend reports, they're sending them to all the artists that they work with. So it's kind of like a mass email that goes out. But other times it is specifically like just to me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I just wanted to clarify. (laughs) There's all, I feel like there's so many different ways you can do these things. Like there's just so many. There's no like clear cut path as There's usual. There's <laughs> so many. I know that like with iCanvas, like I have stuff on iCanvas. It's considered licensed. Uh, it's non exclusive, but they're just selling it on their website. So like I just submitted all of my pieces that I thought were like top sellers or whatever, and then those are just selling to buyers. You know, that's not technically like yeah. a retail store. Yeah. Exactly. Y'all know we are big on protecting your booty and your biz. So we want to tell you all about our secret weapon for mailing invitations for your clients, the USPS Mailing Agreement. It takes the personal emotions out of stressful situations and lets your clients know exactly what will happen when their invitations go out the door and it covers you in case anything goes wrong, which let's be honest, it probably will. I mean, we love you USPS, but you pray, okay? (laughs) Honestly, we've kind of realized that putting a small shipping clause in your contract just isn't enough. Trust us, we know from experience, there are just too many things that can go wrong when mailing. Things like... Ripped flaps, scuffs and scratches, mishandled envelopes, postage snafus, lost invitations never to be seen again, and rabbit overprotective dogs. Okay, that was a little bit of a stretch. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, the point is, all of these are things that you cannot control. So why leave the burden of fate up to the United States Postal Service? Protect yourself with our mailing agreement so your client understands exactly what could happen to their invitations in the mail and how those situations are handled. If you've been scared to mail on behalf of your clients, this is the tool you need to add that next level service to your stationary biz. Go to bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash shop to purchase your copy today at 97 bucks. This is a steal. Seriously, you can't live without it. It's true. Go get it now. Um, okay. So any other strategies, tips we got for our listeners? I think the last thing would just be, um, you know, I, I kind of like was too scared to like start reaching out to people. And then when I did reach out, it was a rejection, but like not letting that you know, like dissuade you, but you can reach out to people. I mean, Google's your best friend, just Google like art licensing companies, or I know that the one I work with, like they always love getting new artists. So it's, which is curated American artists. And then I reached out to her a couple weeks ago when I was doing like a face, like an Instagram live thing. And I was like, yeah, send them my way. So but they're they're great and honestly like you can find so many on Google even like licensing like agents but if you don't want to go that route cuz this is mainly like I don't have stuff on like products mine stuff is just on art like like framed artwork right now um but if you go into stores like even like home goods you know and you see a cute little like art illustration on a mug or a plate like flip it over and see where that manufacturer is and then go home and Google it. Cause sometimes you can find stuff and like they will have like artist submissions or you can find like an email contact that you can like reach out to. And like, don't be afraid to just like pitch yourself. 
Yeah, I agree 100% because it'll be 100% no if you don't ask. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is brilliant advice. Like, I really, one of my goals is that I really want to do an Easter plate for somebody. I just want a bunny. I want to paint a bunny. I want to be on a plate for Easter and I want to be at home goods. So, (laughs) because I always see these cute bunnies and I'm like, God, I want to do a bunny. So, it's a very, very specific goal. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm going to make it happen. Do it. So. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Our audience is going to flip and freak out over this. There's so many good tidbits and advice. And this has been so much oh, fun. Wait. So, <laughs> I still have you. another question. Oh, wait. What? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, oh, well, ahead. it goes back Go to the Etsy shop, if that's okay. Um, because yeah. you said you have like 700 something prints or products. Like, where are you putting all of these? Like, how are you managing inventory? <laughs> I know that's like a whole nother so episode, I, but I just like, I have to know before we end it. Yeah, <laughs> I totally feel like Etsy is like its own total like beast of like yeah. episode. But <laughs> um, <laughs> the so I do print on demand. So I use a local print shop here. So I have everything listed in my shop. And then I I keep inventory of like my popular things, like my construction vehicles, all on a table down in my basement. But um, I I don't have to have inventory for that stuff. And then things like my mugs, I drop it. And so I don't even have to touch any of that. Perfect. That answers my questions. That's that's kind of what I had like figured, (laughs) to be honest. Yeah. Um, I wish I very much wish I could have inventory, but I have like with the amount of pieces and then each piece comes in like seven different right, sizes. Right. There's just no way I can have the inventory. Yeah, no, I think that's like brilliant. I love that you do that. You d- you don't have the overhead of buying everything in advance anyway. So very smart. Right. So maybe we'll have to have you back to talk about that some other time. Yeah, we can do an Etsy episode. That'd be fun. Oh, I'd love that. Um, (laughs) We are so happy that you joined us. And Cami, do you have any final thoughts or do you want me to do like some housekeeping? (laughs) Uh, I was just going to say, Kelsey, let everyone know where they can find you on Instagram and your website and all that jazz. Yeah, my Instagram handle is Kelsey K. McNatt. And then on Etsy, I'm just Kelsey M. Designs. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, all thank right, you. So housekeeping <laughs> for all y'all out there. We are getting close to Christmas. If you want to gift Cammy and I with something extra special, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. I think our last one was like a month or more ago now. And I... Yeah, I was just thinking we forgot to, we like never asked I know. for you. So we that's what we want for Christmas. You that's guys. what we want for Christmas <laughs> from all stars, y'all. Five stars. <laughs> Please <laughs> leave us a rating and review on iTunes if you have not done it. It is how new people find us. And if you are loving this episode with Kelsey, please screenshot it while you're listening to it, wherever you're listening to it. Upload it to Instagram stories and tag all of us. So tag Kelsey at Kelsey at K McNatt, tag Cammy at Cammy Monet, tag me at Eliza Ann Calligraphy, and tag Biz Birthday Bash at Biz Birthday Bash so we can share it too because there are a ton of little great tidbits today, including the agreeable gray piece, which I personally am a huge fan. Um, that, having <laughs> that knowledge in my back pocket going forward, um, <laughs> I'm just teasing because there are other things that were way better, but <laughs> I think. No, that's the best. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think that brings us to an end today. And y'all, we're getting freaking close to Christmas. So Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, all those great things. We still have a few more episodes this year, but we have just been blessed with some fantastic guests this year. It's been really phenomenal. 2020 has been crazy, but it's been great in so many ways. Yes, it has. And now we have to go because we have to go pack order. Yes, we do. (laughs) We love you all. Goodbye. (laughs) Bye, everyone. Bye.